Welcome to my channel. This is an indication of some of the things that I cover on a regular basis in my videos. If you haven't already subscribed, please feel free to do so. And don't forget to click the little bell so that you'll get notified of future videos. Please feel free to share my videos on your social media. And I hope you enjoy the video which follows. Well, hello everyone. I'm doing a cheese making video which I haven't done in a long time. Out of this book, which I really like, I've done a few other cheeses out of it. The one that I'm doing is called Car Philly. You can see the spelling there, but evidently it is pronounced Car Philly, which is a town in Wales, um, where the cheese is believed to have originated, so it's named after the town in Wales. It's a cheddar type cheese, and the recipe that I'm using is very simple. I hope it turns out okay. I watched another very popular YouTuber, if you're a cheesemaker you probably know who I mean, does much better cheese making videos than I do, and I watched his video on making Carfilli, and wow, mine is, the one that I'm using out of this book is so much simpler. Uh, it says that it's a type of a cheddar, although it's not cheddared. Well, he cheddared his and everything, it, a lot of process involved, but hopefully you will see when I finish this that it didn't take too much effort to do this one. I'm actually probably one of the simpler cheeses that I've made and it is the first time that I've ever used a sous vide. I just got it yesterday. It came by by mail from Amazon. I bought the least expensive one on the market. I tested it yesterday by having this uh, five gallon container full of water instead of milk. It worked beautifully. I have it now set at 90. Right now it says the water is reading 91 degrees outside. But it is set at 90 and it's got four gallons of uh, very cold milk in there. It took about two hours uh, to bring it up to the 90 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius that I need to get started when it was water. And I started with ice cold water um, outside of the container. This time I used sort of lukewarm water, so maybe it'll go a bit slower. But anyway, what I liked about it, it brought it up exactly to the temperature and then it holds it at the temperature. It never, it never overheats it. So I'm excited to use the thing and hoping when I finish here I'll like it as well as I do now. Well, I'll bring you back when I've got the milk up to temperature. I suspect that'll be an hour, an hour and a half from now, but time will fly faster for you. Perhaps I should offer a bit of an explanation in case you're somebody like me who, well, I do know now, but didn't know a while ago what a sous vide was. I think it's a trend, a fad, that's only been out for maybe a couple of years. At least I started seeing them a couple of years ago. I think prior to that they might have been used in high-end restaurants or whatever. This particular one uh, was 70-something, 70 70-some $70 dollars. And I don't pay shipping, I have Amazon Prime, and I also received a nice gift card for Christmas, so I applied part of that to it. Uh, this is the least expensive one that Amazon sells anyway, and as I say, it's around $70. They have them that go up all the way to $450, <laughs> not for me, but the $450 ones even work on Wi-Fi. You can control it with your smartphone and whatever. Well, I don't need that. Uh, it's used for what I consider a strange way of cooking. Um, meat, uh, some vegetables. I've seen videos where fish is cooked with it. I may eventually try it with fish or vegetables or eggs or something like that. Uh, but it's most popular, I think, with meat, like a big steak. You seal that in a, either a vacuum-packed plastic or a Ziploc plastic bag and you float it in water or submerge it in water and attach the sous vide and whatever temperature, I haven't looked that into it in detail, you set it at whatever temperature and it may stay in that water for five or six hours. <laughs> when it has gone through its period in the water you take it out and you still fry or grill it or something. So really I don't know what the big thing is about it. I mean why wouldn't you just grill it in the first place if it's a good quality steak or whatever. But that's what they're used for. And as I say, I, I have seen several of the uh, cheese making forums that I subscribe to where people are raving about it for making cheese. And 
from my little bit of experience yesterday with water, I think I'm going to agree. It's circulating this water now. It still has it at 91 degrees. And I thought I set it for 90, but I'm not going to worry about one degree. The temperature of the milk inside, I just checked, is like 79. So it's got quite a ways to go before it reaches 90 Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius. But whenever it's uh, adding more heat, this little light thing here changes from white to red. Uh, sort of flashing in between there right now, yeah, so it's it, it adding a bit more heat occasionally, but it's circulating that water all the time. I have the big stainless steel pot on a wire rack, like a cooling rack that you would cool the cake on or whatever, so that those water can circulate under it as well, and it's doing a wonderful job, so we will see how things <laughs> how things go when I'm, when I'm finished here, but I think I'm going to light my sous vide. Well, the milk has just reached 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and now you add the cultures. There are two cultures. The first one is called mesophilic type 2, and the second one is also a mesophilic called mesophilic aroma type B. A quarter teaspoon of each. And if you notice here, these are the origin. These are made in Canada. They're made in Quebec, actually in uh, saint Saint in Quebec. I know of three companies in Canada where I could buy these. I bought these in the U.S. at thecheesemaking.com for half what they cost in Canada. I don't understand that one. All three companies wanted twice as much for them as I paid in the U.S. So it's a quarter teaspoon of each of those. And you just sprinkle that over the surface of the milk. Let's see if I can get the second teaspoon. There we are. And this just is allowed to set for five minutes while the powder hydrates. So I'll bring you back in five minutes time. Well, it's had its five minutes to hydrate and now you just sort of mix it into the milk, get it off the surface and down into the volume of the milk. And this book always suggests that you do it with the thing that I'm using here, a skimmer or whatever you want to call it, a cheese making utensil anyway. In an up and down motion and without breaking the surface of the milk with it. So it sort of hauls the uh, cultures that were sitting on the surface, it hauls it down into the milk. Do you hear little beep, beep, beeps every once in a while? It's this sous vide. Whatever I've done, every, every, every minute it seems to do a, a series of beeps. I don't care as long as it's maintaining the temperature. Instructions that come with this particular one are almost non-existent and that was one of the complaints on Amazon but all I needed to do was heat water and I'm sure I was able to figure it out and I think I have. Uh, the instructions would appear to be probably originally in Chinese and it's a very strange translation <laughs> into English. Uh, so it's sort of trial and error. Once you figure out what you're doing, you just do it the same way the next time. And This is basically all I want it to ever do for me, so I am pleased. Well, I think that will do for mixing it in. And if I knew what I did with the cover. Here it is. This now rests for half an hour and maintaining the 90 degree Fahrenheit 32 degrees Celsius temperature, which my sous vide hopefully will do for me. So I'll bring you back in a half hour's time. Well, it's been sitting there for a half hour. I just checked the temperature and it has maintained the temperature spot on at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I'm adding three quarters of a teaspoon of calcium chloride diluted in a quarter of a cup of just cold tap water for me. If you're using city water with chlorine and whatever, you 
should probably buy yourself a small bottle of spring water or something like that rather than use ones that has maybe chlorine and even fluorine in it but mine's just out of my deep well so it's there's no additives at all and I'm doing trying to do the same thing as to incorporate that with just the up and down motion with this ladle type thing here if you're using raw milk uh, milk that hasn't been pasteurized you don't have to add the calcium chloride but with pasteurized milk you have to add it and now three quarters of a teaspoon of rennet diluted again in a quarter cup of water and I'm using animal rennet there are other kinds vegetable rennet don't know if you can get a liquid vegetable rennet or not I've only ever seen it in tablet form but I've always used the animal rennet so that's what I'm sticking with I'm a vegetarian and not a vegan I guess if it was going to be well vegan cheese wouldn't have milk in it to begin with so Rennet is a substance that is uh, the animal rennet. Uh, if you don't know, I don't know what the process is, but it comes from the stomach. Uh, I can't remember if that's a calf or if it's a full-grown cow or if it's been butchered, obviously. to remove this ladle. I left it in once <laughs> after adding the rennet. And there it was frozen in place. Okay, so just stop the motion of the water. The water, the milk rather, by doing this. Now, it rests and maintaining the 90 degree temperature, which my sous vide is doing beautifully. It rests for 45 minutes, so I'll bring you back in 45 minutes time. So it's had its 45 minute rest, and now I'll check to see if there's a clean break in the curd. You just do that by sticking your curd knife in and bringing it up. And seeing what I just saw, that's a nice clean break. So the curd is ready. And I will now cut it into roughly half inch sections. And I won't make you sit there and watch me do all of that. I'll go all the way across here doing it that way and then I'll go back and go across this way so that I have a hatch patch, <laughs> whatever I'm trying to say, pattern across the top. Once I've done that much, I'll bring you back and show you what I do next. Well, I finished that process, and there are many ways of doing the next step. You can use that uh, ladle thing that I was using and go down and keep cutting it. You could also use the cheese curd knife and just go in on an angle. I have found what I prefer is to use a large whisk, and I just insert it and go around slowly sort of in concentric circles until I get to the middle and then when I come back out to the outside I go down a bit further with it and I keep doing that until I hit the bottom so I will bring you back when I have finished this part. Well I finished that part and now the curd is allowed to just rest and settle for about five minutes in which time it should firm up a little more. Now I guess what we're going to do is cook it. I have reset the sous vide to 95 degrees Fahrenheit that's uh, 35 degrees Celsius and over the next 30 minutes the attempt to raise the curd and the whey solution here up to 95 degrees 
you don't want to do it faster than 30 minutes and from what I've seen the way this performs in the recent past here I don't think that will be a problem it may take longer than 30 minutes longer is okay you just don't want to do it too quickly so I have to stir continually for the next 30 minutes and monitor the temperature that it doesn't go above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't think I've said uh, I'm using Canadian milk, so that's it was measured in metric, of course, 16 liters of whole milk. That's 3.5 percent butter fat or whatever. Um, if you're watching in the U.S. Uh, four gallons will work just as well. It's not exactly the same amount of milk, but it's cheese, it's not rocket science. So far so good. I'm, I mean there's a bit of time involved. This is the most work I've done since I started. I've got to stir for a half hour. But, uh, I just hope I like this when it finishes in a few weeks time. It doesn't age very long. Uh, it can be eaten after three weeks. You can age it longer, up to eight to ten weeks, and then try it. And that's probably what I'll do. I'll let it go at least eight, maybe ten weeks. It's supposed to have quite a sharp, like cheddar flavor, just not as solid as cheddar. And the instructions in the booklet say you can do it as a natural washed rind or you uh, can wax it. If you do the natural washed rind, the outside layer will become, well, I said soft and creamy. If you wax it, and I, I will be waxing it with the artificial cheese wax, some sort of a paint on stuff, I've used a few times, because I don't want the, I don't like the idea of the soft and creamy on the outside. It will be firm throughout if you uh, wax it. So. That's what I will be doing and hoping that I like it because it's a very straightforward, easy, easy cheese to make so far anyway. Unless some catastrophe happens shortly here. So I'll bring you back when I have this up to 95 degrees. Well, I was 55 minutes doing it, which is, as I said, that's fine. Uh, as long as you don't do it in a faster time, a longer time is better. And as you can see, the curd is a lot smaller now. Some pieces are still quite large in there, but most of it sort of looks like cottage cheese curds. Now, it gets covered, and you maintain the temperature of 95 degrees, 35 Celsius, for 45 minutes, which I'm sure the sous vide will do. I'm really liking this thing. It was slow raising the temperature up, but that's not a problem. Uh, it has made the work so much easier and so much more accurate. Um, doing this in a hot water bath on the stove, you invariably get it warmer than you wanted it and all that sort of thing. But uh, it could be a bit cooler, but for this thing set on 95, it can't go higher than 95. And I use my digital instant read thermometer and the digital thermometer agrees with this exactly, so if, if they're wrong, they're both wrong, but the same amount, I guess. So I'll bring you back in 45 minutes. Okay, it's had its 45 minutes resting at uh, 95 degrees. The mold that I'm going to use is a Gouda mold. Um, I like it so much that I use it for other cheeses as well, mainly because I don't have to use cheesecloth it comes with this liner and you put the curd down in there and when you have to take it out to turn the curd over to press it again you just take this out and, and do it it's so much so much easier I, it's sitting in a colander and I have lined the colander with some cheesecloth just in case I lose some of the um, curd when I'm pouring it down in here but I want to pour all of the way through the uh, mold as well because that will warm the mold up to the same temperature as the curd. So here goes nothing and hopefully I won't I won't upset the whole thing. Always a concern at this stage.
Oops. Can you still see anything? I just kicked the camera out of the way. Settle down because that's mostly just whey. Very, very little curd has come out yet. There are holes in the side and the bottom of that mold, but they're they're very small, so it takes the whey a bit of time to come out of there. getting down now so that there isn't that much whey left in the in the big pot it's mostly curd Also blocks up some of the holes so it takes it longer to drain. I may uh, pause the camera and before I get finished here, although I'm down now to mostly curd anyway, I guess. so we can get out. I will not be using. That is most of it. Now there is a, a top that goes on the goes on the mold like that. I'll spend some time putting that together the way that I want it and I do have some curd down in the cheesecloth here. And I'll bring you back when I have this ready to go on the cheese press. Okay, that's it ready to go in the press. Remember how to put it back together, we'll be all set here. My main complaint, or only complaint, I guess, about this particular book is it never gives specific weights to press things at. It says medium or hard or that sort of thing, but I did some research on a previous cheese that I made with this book and um, determined what I thought was medium anyway, anywhere from uh, 20 to 25 pounds of pressure and this now gets pressed at that medium pressure 20 to 25 pounds for 30 minutes and I'm sure during that time I'll have to keep readjusting it because as it as it pushes out the way it uh, loses pressure but that's it to begin with there at about 25 now but once it goes to 20 I'll increase the pressure on it just a bit and I'll bring you back in 30 minutes time. While it's in the press for its first 30 minutes I'm making an 18 percent uh, brine solution which won't be used until tomorrow. It stays in the press overnight. Uh, uh, I've got it on the stove heating it because that 
makes the salt dissolve better if you heat it. And there's lots of time to cool it before I need it tomorrow. Uh, and 18 percent is one part salt for every five parts of water. So this particular one I have 15 cups of water and three cups of salt. A fine sea salt is what I'm using, a non-iodized natural fine sea salt. You can use any non-iodized salt. You just have to get it dissolved in the water. And I think I can shut the heat off now because I don't see any salt crystals left. It has all dissolved. But after it has been in the press overnight, it will go 20 hours in the brine. Uh, 10 hours and then you flip it in another 10 hours. So anyway, you'll see that part tomorrow. And I can shut the heat off, I guess, because my 18% brine looks like it's ready. Well, it's had its 30 minutes, it's first pressing, and according to the instructions, it only gets turned once, and this is when, when it happens, it'll stay under the same amount of pressure all night. I had to adjust this several times, because as you can see, the follower has gone way down in, it was right up at the surface when we began, so it's, it has expelled a lot of the whey. And every time it goes down further, it decreases the amount of pressure. So I had to adjust it several times. I suspect I will be adjusting it several more times. I'm up usually at some point in the night anyway. I'll check it. But uh, of this you can see. <laughs> My arms are probably in the way, right? They usually are. But this is what I like about this mold. Having said that, I'll now destroy this cheese probably. But there we go. You just put the mold back in and to turn the cheese you just bring it and drop it back in again. No re-wrapping it or any of that stuff that you have to do with when you're, when you're using uh, cheesecloth. So I really like it. It is fairly expensive. I no longer, of course, remember what I paid for it, but it was worth it in my opinion. I suppose there are other shapes and types of molds that use the same thing, but the only one I've been able to find is the... this one is a Gouda mold. And it is an authentic Gouda mold, I guess, from from the Netherlands. I didn't buy it directly from the Netherlands, but I bought it from a Canadian company that imports them. And I really like the thing. So that's half the battle over, if you like it. Now, once again, back at 25 pounds of pressure or so. And that's it. I'll see you in the morning. Uh, as I said, I will be checking this frequently and sh I'm sure readjusting the, the pressure. But as it gets down further and the curd, you know, the cheese itself starts to cool off, there will become a point where it won't expel any more whey at that particular amount of pressure. And that's the pressure it says to maintain, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm really liking this. I'm really liking the sous vide. Uh, amazing little piece of equipment. I'm awfully glad that I bought it. I, it's uh, it's so tedious doing getting the temperatures right and uh, the sous vide made it so easy so I suspect I'll be trying some other cheeses soon that I haven't made yet but I'll see you in the morning. Well I've done a bit of recording here with the wrong memory card in the camcorder and it didn't record anything. I have taken it out of the press. It lost a lot more of its way over the night, overnight, and I weighed it. And I think it's probably the heaviest cheese I've ever managed to make out of uh, 16 liters, 4 gallons of, of milk. It's just a fraction of an ounce below 5 pounds. So that's quite, that part is quite impressive. I presume because it was pressed so lightly. If it was pressed at a heavier weight, it would have lost a lot more of its uh, way. But that's okay. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping I like this thing. <laughs> I 
can't get over how easy it's been to make and I'm, I'm impressed with it so far but it'll be several weeks from now before I find out if I like the flavor or not that is the 18% brine that I made last evening and it's completely cooled now to room temperature it gets brined for 20 hours at 10 hours I will flip it and uh, do the other 10 hours with it, you know, the other side up. So this top part here that is above the brine also gets brined. I won't bother to bring you back to watch me flip the cheese. It's something that takes about three seconds, but I'll show you the final product and maybe weigh it again. I'm curious as to whether or not the salt draws out more of the uh, whey that's still in the cheese, but we will see in 20 hours time. Well, the cheese has been brining for 20 hours and I just removed it. Now it will uh, stay out at, at room temperature for a while while it, the surface of it dries so you can wax it. In the summertime that might take two or three days but there's such low humidity in my house here in the winter that I don't think it will take all that long, probably 24 hours or so. But I want to weigh it and see if anything changed while it was in the brine. Okay, we have 2,201 grams, so that's a little over 2 kilos, Let's see if I can switch that to pounds, 4 pounds, 8.5 ounces, um, no, okay, that was 4 pounds, 0.8, 4.8 pounds, it's 4 pounds, 13 Point seven ounces, so it did lose a few ounces in the in the brine. Rather than soaking in uh, more liquid, the the salt has drawn out some more of the of the whey. So anyway, I will now put this uh, probably in the dining room, I guess, on the table, covered over with a tea towel, so it won't get dust on it, or if there's a fly or anything around it, won't land on it. And I'll bring you back when it's time to put on the cheese coating that I use. I almost said wax. It's not wax. It's a coating that you paint on and I like it much better than wax. It gets a good covering. You know, I put on two or three layers depending on how how well it's, it's looking at the time, but at least two layers. So I'll bring you back when that happens. Well, The cheese has been drying for over 24 hours and the surface feels quite dry to me. In the summertime that wouldn't be enough. House. There's no humidity in the house in the wintertime, so it dries quite quickly. And now I'm just going to paint on at least two layers of this uh, water-soluble cheese coating. I don't know whether to call it plastic or what to call it, but it's the same professional coating that's used in a number of cheeses when you buy them. It's not a wax, but it does cover the cheese nicely. And two coats is a lot better than one. That way you're sure you've got all of the crevices or whatever covered, but this doesn't seem to have any crevices. It pressed very nicely. You have to wait for it to completely dry in between applications. Smile. do at least half of it. When it dries I'll flip it over and do the other half. You don't need to watch me do that. I'll bring you back and show you the final product after it has been coated and dried and ready to move into the cheese fridge. I'm thinking I will let it age uh, in the cheese fridge, the, fr the cheese cave, whatever you want to call it. I have a special refrigerator small refrigerator that uh, I run on a, a thermostat that's designed for a cheese cave. You plug the refrigerator into the thermostat and plug the thermostat into the wall outlet and you put a sensor inside so that uh, 
you can run the refrigerator at a lower temperature than it would ever normally run at itself. And I think this one is the same. It's supposed to go from 50 to 54 degrees is the recommended temperature for aging it. And I think, as I said, I'm going to go about eight weeks. It's ready to eat, it says, in three weeks, but you get a sharper flavor if you age it eight to ten weeks. So I'll go with eight. Impatient, I want to see what it tastes like. Well, that's sort of that one side done. And as I said, I won't bother to bring you back. I'll bring you when it's uh, had its two coats and both coats are, are dry. One car Philly cheese ready for the cheese cave, cheese fridge. And I did check, it uh, is supposed to be at a temperature range of 50 to 54 degrees, and that's what my uh, fridge is set at right now anyway, so I lucked out there. I weighed it, um, I guess it was prior to putting the, the coating on it, but the coating wouldn't add anything much. I want to know what the cheese weighed anyway. From the time it came out of the press until I started putting the coating on it, it had lost four ounces. So it weighs four pounds, 12 ounces. And I just checked on the calendar. The uh, eight weeks from now will be March the 3rd. So I'm going to put that into my computer calendar or March the 3rd. I'll cut into this and see what it's like and I'll bring you along so that you can see that. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching this. And if you're a cheese maker, I think Carfilly is one to, to try, especially if you've got a sous vide. Made the process so much easier and this, I hope I like this cheese because the, the process of making this cheese is so much easier anyway and it so far looks good. So, anxious to see what it tastes like. Thank you for watching.